All right. Uh, hello and welcome to the uh, Swedish National Data Service webinar. Uh, and this time it's about uh, qualitative data analysis software with an introduction to Envivo. And uh, my name is Andre Jernung. Uh, I am a uh, research data advisor at the Swedish National Data Service. And I'm going to be joined by uh, Sara landedal Stitsberg, who is a uh, librarian at Mälardalen University. And she's going to do a um, basic introduction to NVivo, and uh, I'm going to follow up with a uh, present, short presentation about um, research data management aspects of NVivo. So without further ado, please, Sara, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, I just have to share my presentation. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, yeah, welcome to this introduction to Envivo. Uh, and as I, Andrea mentioned, my name is Sara Landerol Stritsberg, and I work as a librarian at Mälardalen University. Uh, and this webinar is a basic introduction. Uh, Envivo has many functionalities, and I will show some of them. And the aim is that you will get an idea about how the software works. But first, some housekeeping rules. Uh, as Andrea said, this uh, presentation is recorded. Uh, and questions will be answered after the presentation. So please use the Q&A function or frågor och svar function and you find it next to the chat in Zoom. In this webinar, I will talk about and show you examples of the following futures in Envivo. And I will switch between the presentation and Envivo. And there are many more functionalities in Envivo than I will show you today, but I hope that this will provide you with some basic knowledge and that you can use it as a starting point for learning more about Envivo yourself. And first, a brief background. Envivo is a qualitative data analysis software or QDA software. That means that it assists researchers in performing qualitative analysis. And Envivo is just one of many QDA softwares. Some are free and some, like Envivo, you have to buy a license to use. And some are specialized in analyzing text and other aimed at video markup. And common to all QDA software is that they are used to organize, manage, and analyze information. And with Envivo, you can import data from a wide range of sources. You can mark up text, video, and audio. You can ask questions to your data to identify themes and draw conclusions. And you can visualize your data. And Envivo is available for both PC and Mac, and most features are the same. However, the Windows version has a few more, and I will show you the Envivo 14 Windows version. And I recommend the Envivo manual for guidance and help. And in my presentation, I have added links to the manual in each slide for the functions that I am talking about. And before we begin, I would like to mention some aspects to consider when creating a project. Uh, Envivo is locally installed on your computer and you must buy a license to have access to the program. And to avoid file corruption, you should save your Envivo project on your local computer, not on a network location or USB stick. And Envivo supports several languages, uh, but your content or research project can be in any language. However, some functionalities, such as stop words when doing a word query, won't work if your material is not in any of the supported languages. And if you don't use autosave, it can be a good idea to set reminders for saving 
For example, you can set a reminder to save every 15 minutes. And if there are several persons working on a project, you can enable user logs to see who have done what. There are several ways to cooperate in Envivo. You can do it manually by sharing files or your institution can set up a local collaboration server. There are also an add-on module called Collaboration Cloud that allows collaboration in real time. And if your project involves sensitive personal data, consider if it's suitable to you early for you to use the collaboration cloud option. Before we continue to have a look at the program, I will just introduce you to some key terms that Envivo uses. The terms files, coding, cases and classification are essential. In Envivo, files include the material you want to analyze and your ideas about them. And you code files in order to collect in one place, called a code, all the content related to the themes you identify. And in previous versions of Envivo, codes were called nodes. So if you have used Envivo before, maybe you are familiar with the term nodes instead of codes. And cases are the units of analysis in a project. The cases could be, for example, people, organizations, locations, or any other entity that you are researching. And you can classify your cases. And that means that you give your cases attributes and values. For persons, it can be, for example, age, gender, or education level. And classification helps you to compare and analyze your material. The Envivo workspace looks like this. You have a navigation bar to the left, uh, the blue section, and a title bar at the top of the screen. If you click on a file, it will be opened in the detailed view. And here you can also edit the file. After you have created a project, the first step is to upload the material that you are going to analyze. And your material or files are stored under data where you can create, create subfolders. And you can add files in different formats, for example, Word files, Excel files, files from reference management programs, from survey programs, social media, and so on. And Vivo can also capture websites and convert them to PDFs with the web plugin NCapture. Something else that can be good to know when you start a project in Envivo is the possibility to create memos. And memos could work as a research journal or as annotations about, for example, a file or a code. And memos is a way to keep your analysis separate from, but linked to, the material you are analyzing. An advantage of memos is that you don't have to save separate Word files with notes. Instead, everything relating to the project is saved in the project when you are using memos. Another function in Envivo is the possibility to make annotations. And with annotations, you can make comments about selected content. And you can think that an annotation is a little bit like a post-it note. Uh, you can make annotations in documents, audio or video files, pictures and PDFs. You can also make annotations about codes and memos. And one more feature is links. You can create links between items, for example, files in your project. And you can also create hyperlinks to online material. 
So now it's time to leave the presentation for a while to have a look at Envivo. So uh, I hope you all see Envivo. Uh, and when Envivo opens, you can choose to create a new project or you can open a sample project. And in a sample project, you can see an example of what a real project can look like. And in this webinar, I will use a multi-method sample project called Environmental Change Down East. And that's the one that you see on the screen. And this project investigates the environment, environment and people in a coastal area of the United States. And as you can see here, when I open the project, this project already contain files and you find the files under data. But if it was a new project, a first step would be to import content and you find import up here in the title bar. And here you see that you have several options uh, on the types of files that you want to import. And in the navigation bar, the blue section here to the left, I can organize my files into folders and subfolders. And as an example, I'm going to add a new folder. Then I just uh, right click on files and I choose new folder. And I can name the new folder. Uh, I will name it photos and I can also add a description about this folder. And I click OK and the new folder appears here. And now it's empty and I want to import the file from my computer. So I click on files and I want to import this picture of some boats and I import it. And I can rename it if I want to, and I can also add a description about it, maybe when it was taken and where it was taken. And I click OK. And now you see I have my photo here and I can click on it and it will open in detail view. And here I can uh, work with it, I can edit it and uh, add annotations and so on. So we will continue by having a look at memos that I mentioned before. And memos you find further down here in the navigation view under notes. And here are the memos. And we have some progress reports that we're going to have a look at. Uh, and here are the progress reports of this sample project. And if I click on one of the progress reports, we can see uh, how it has been done. So this is an example of something that you can do with memos. You can have, uh, you can create reports about how you, your project is proceeding. And if you want to create a new memo, you go up to the title bar to create and you choose memo. And each file, code or case can have one memo linked to it. Or you can create standalone memos like this progress report. So let's go to annotations. Uh, so we're going to have a quick look at annotations and links. And in this case, I'm going to go to interview. So I'm going to the folder interviews here under data and I'm going to cho choose an interview and I'm going to choose the interview with Margaret and I double click on it so it will open and you see here in detail view that you can have several items opened at once. And if I want to add an annotation, I mark the text that I want to add an annotation about. So I want to add an annotation about Margaret works at the museum. And then I go to the annotation symbol up here and choose add annotation. And you see at the bottom of the screen, you can add an annotation. And in this, this case, I want to look up which museum Margaret is working at. 
And now I have created an annotation and I can see it in my text because an annotation symbol appears. You can connect files by see also links and we can have a look at the see also links in Margaret's interview. And you can see them if you are clicking on the link symbol up here and I will choose view see also links and then the uh, see also links uh, appear at the bottom of the screen. And if I click on it, I will see the text that this see also link is linked to. And if I double click on the see also link, uh, Envivo will take me to uh, the photo that was linked. So now back to the presentation to talk more about codes or nodes as they were called in previous Envivo versions. Codes, uh, yes, codes bring, bring together in one place all the references to specific themes, emotions or relationships from your data. And you can code words or sentences or whole files. And you can create a coding structure in advance or code as you go. And that's called to call in vivo. You can use queries to automatically code files based on words or phrases they contain. And it is possible to let Envivo automatically code your material. You can do it in several ways. You can do it by using existing code and patterns. Then you have to code at least 10% of your material to learn Envivo and then Envivo can autocode based on that. You can also let Envivo autocode by themes and that is that Envivo codes on its own based on noun phrases. And Envivo can also autocode for sentiments, for positive or negative sentiments in the text. However, automatic coding is based on algorithm and you must always check and correct and it works best if your material is in English or any other language supported by Envivo. So time to switch over to Envivo to show you codes. Codes are a way of tagging or marking up your content. And depending on your method, you may have a coding structure set in advance or you may code as you go through your material. You can do both in Envivo. And you find codes uh, here under coding and codes. And if I click on codes, I can see the coding structure for this sample project. And if you have a look at the code, you can see how many reference a code has. You see like community change here has 62 references. And that means how many times it has been used. And if you click on a code, you get a summary of the files that have content coded to this code. So let's see. now it <laughs> and we and Vivo wasn't with with us but now it is so i click on community change and i will get a summary of all the references that have been collected in this code and if i want to create a new code to this coding structure i go up to create in the title bar and i choose code and now i can create a new code I can name it and I can add a description about it. Uh, and uh, if uh, we want to see the coding for a specific document, we can do that in several ways. One way is to open the document. So I'm going up to the documents again and I'm going to open a file and uh, in this case, I'm going to open a news article. So you see here, I'm going to open a news article 
called Crossroads. And uh, because this is a sample project, uh, the coding is already done in this project. And I want to see uh, what has been done to, to this uh, file. And to be able to see it, I can click on the little stripe symbol up here. So I click on that symbol and I choose uh, show coding stripes and all. And now you see here to the right, maybe I can do it, make it a little bit bigger. You see that coding stripes for this document appears. And if I click on one of the stripes, maybe I want to click on the green one, real estate development, then the text that has been coded to this code is highlighted. And if I want to code myself, now I see the coding that has been done, but maybe I want to code myself, then uh, there are several ways to do this. One easy way is that I mark the text I want to code. I can mark a word or whole sentence. Uh, and I, uh, I mark it, I right click, I choose code selection, and I choose the code that I want to code this section of text to. So I chose to code it to natural environment and I click on code selection. So now I have coded it to that code. Uh, and I can also come up with new codes as I go through the material. So maybe I want to have something, I want to have a new code about shellfishing waters. Then I mark the text I want to code. I right click and I chose code in vivo. Then I create a new code. And if I click on codes here in the navigation bar, then I see that I have created a new code called shellfishing waters and I can right click on it and I if I want to change its uh, change its na the name to something else I right click choose code properties and I can rename it and I can add a description so so you can do it both ways you can come up with new codes as you read or you can have a coding structure set in advance. Uh, if you want to visualize the coding made to a specific file, you can do it by uh, clicking on the file. And I'm going back now to, let's see, to the news articles. If I want to visualize the coding in the news articles, I can do it like I did. I can. Uh, uh, see the coding stripes, but I can also uh, make a chart of the coding in a specific file. And I can do that by clicking on the file, right clicking, and choose visualization and chart PDF coding. And now I get a chart uh, of co the coding done in this file. I can also compare the coding in two files by marking both files. So I'm going to mark both uh, news articles. I'm right clicking. I go down to visualize and I choose compare. Now Envivo will create a diagram for me. Uh, and I will see which codes that the two files have both been coded to, to. That's the one in the middle. And which only one of them have been coded to. And that's the ones on the side. And if I want to, I can right click and I can export this uh, diagram or I can print it. I also mentioned before that you can use queries to automatically code files based on words or phrases they contain. And this can be a useful starting point for reviewing data. And you find queries under the explore, uh, under explore in the title bar up here.
and I'm going to do a text search query. So I click on text search and I'm going to run a query for a specific word. And in this case, I want to search for the word bird and I want it stemmed so that I also get results for birds, for example. And I want to spread the uh, context to narrow so that I also will include the words that uh, are uh, next to the word birds. And then I run the query. So now Envivo is looking uh, uh, after the word bird or birds in this project. And you see here is a summary of the files that contain the word birds. And if I click on references, I will see the references. I will see uh, where in the text that bird occurs. And I can save this as a new code. So I'm going up here to save results. I click on save results, create results as a new code or case. And I want to save it as a code. And I want to save it as a child code to natural environment. So I mark it and click OK. And then I name the new code birds. And then I can also add a description. And I click OK. So, and Envivo thinks a little bit. Let's see if it has appeared. Uh, if I go to codes here in the navigation bar. And let's see if I can see it under natural environment. Yes, here is my new code, birds. So here I have everything uh, that, men, uh, that contains the word birds. So I'm now uh, returning to the presentation and we are going to have a look at cases. Cases gathers information related to your object of analysis in one place. A case holds together everything you know about a unit of analysis, such as Ken in this example. Think of a case as a bucket. In, for example, a person's case, you will gather all the information related to the person from interviews, survey results, recordings, pictures, etc. A case usually relates to a definable unit of analysis, such as persons or places, rather than concepts that are gathered in a code. And you can create cases manually, or you can let Envivo create them for you. The later is possible if your material, for example, consists of interviews or surveys. And then it's possible to create a case for each respondent automatically. And if you want to learn more about this, then you have the links at the bottom of this slide. And each case can be classified, which means that the case has different attributes and values. And this will help you to analyze the material later on. And you can do this manually or automatically by importing a case classification sheet. Attribute values record information known about a case, for example, gender. And the primary purpose for creating attributes is to group cases for comparison, which we will have a brief look at later. And queries uh, help you to explore your data. When you run a query, Envivo searches through your data to locate all text references, pictures or media that meet the criteria of your inquiry. And we have already had a look at the text search query and you can do many other queries. You can, for example, see how frequent a word is used or compare coding with attribute values. 
you can also make different types of visualizations to analyze your material and to get a greater knowledge of it. And visualizations is also useful when presenting your project. If you are using NVivo for Windows, you can create reports containing information about your project that you can view and print. And NVivo provides a number of predefined reports, uh, but you can also build your own reports. So now it's time to go back to NVivo to have a look at cases and classification. You find cases in the navigation bar, uh, and I'm just going to make room for it. Uh, so you see cases here is a little briefcase symbol, and here are the cases. And in this sample project, as we can see, there are cases for both people and places. And if I click on people like I did, I see that each interview participant has its own case. So I can open it up and see each participant's case. And I can create new cases manually by clicking on create up here in the title bar and case. I can also let NVivo do it for me automatically. And to add information to a case is similar to coding. And I'm now going to show you the manual way of doing it. If I, for example, want to add Betty's answer, answers in the interview with her to her case, I will go to the interview with Betty under files here and interviews. And I will show the Betty's interview, the interview with Betty and Paul. So here we see the interview and uh, it's a video interview, but it's transcribed. So if I want to add Betty's answers to Betty's case, then I can mark her answers, hello, her answer, and I right click and I choose code selection. But instead of uh, coding it, I go down to cases and people and interview participants and Betty. And I code this selection to Betty. Uh, I add it to her case. And the advantage of separating her answers and adding them to her case is that you can analyze her answers separate from the interviewer's questions or in this interview that involves two people from the other participants answer. And you can use Betty's case if we go down to the cases again and click on people and Betty here. Uh, we can use her case to create a visualization and I'm going to do this in the form of a word cloud. So I'm marking Betty's case. Uh, I right click. I go down to visualize and I choose word cloud. Now this word cloud will only contain words used by Betty, not by the interviewer or anybody else. Uh, so that is an advantage of having cases. Uh, so let's see, and Vivo is working. So now you see a word cloud illustrating the words most commonly used by Betty. And uh, if you want to uh, copy it or print it, just right click on the word cloud and choose the option that you want to do. So that, that was a little bit about cases. If I go further down in the navigation bar, I will see case classifications. And here I can see the attributes used for persons 
for example. So they have the attributes township, community, etc. And if I go further down in the menu and click on persons, then I see each person in this project. And if I click on a person, if I click on Barbara, then I can see the attributes and the values that belongs to this person. And if I want to, I can add new attributes as well. As I mentioned before, the primary purpose for creating attributes is to group cases for comparison. And one way of doing that is making a cross-tab query. And cross-tab queries are a quick way to check the spread of coding across cases. And in this example, I will use cross-tab queries to compare how often a specific code occurs among people from different townships. So to do a cross-tab query, I will go up to explore in the title bar and I will click on queries and choose cross tab. And first I have to choose the codes I want to uh, have in my cross tab query. So I click on the plus here and then I can choose the codes. And in this case, I want to have sense uh, no, sorry, real estate development. So I click on OK. And I want to compare it with uh, the person's classification and township. And I can uh, choose which one, but this, this is the ones I want to use right now. And then I run the query. And as you see, uh, I get uh, a chart. Uh, here, if I click to the right, it's uh, very small. I get a chart and a cross tab uh, where I see how the coding is divided between different townships, how many times the code real estate development occurs. So I can see that uh, in the Straits township, uh, they seem to it seemed to be the township where real uh, estate development occurs the most. And cross-tab queries is something that may help me to get new insights on my project. Another possibility is to create hierarchy charts. And by doing that, I can, for example, visualize the demographic spread of the persons in my project. And to do that, I have to go up to Explore again and choose Hierarchy Chart. And I get several options. And the option I'm going to choose is this one, Attribute Values Assigned to Cases. And I click Next. And then I choose which classification I want to uh, have a look at, and I will choose persons, and also which attributes I want to have a look at. And I want to have a look at gender and age group. And then I click finish. So now I get a chart over the participants' gender and ages. And this chart, uh, chart it tells me that this project has slightly more male participants. You see the orange part here, then female, the blue part. And I can also see which age groups that are most prominent. And if I want to export the chart, I right click. So. Back to the presentation. After finishing your project, besides saving it as an uh, Envivo project in a safe location, uh, save it also in a format that is possible to open for non Envivo users. This enables reusability. And if you want to learn more about it, you can always read more via the links down here and 
uh, Andrea is also going to talk more about it. So that was all for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sara, uh, for the very uh, comprehensive uh, demo and presentation uh, with a lot of practical examples. Very useful, uh, of course. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, shortly. Um, All right, uh, looks like it's working. So, um, as previously mentioned, uh, I work as a uh, research data advisor and uh, with various issues related to research data management. And uh, I'm going to talk briefly about some things that you should keep in mind from a data management perspective before starting out a, a project using NBVO. And uh, Sara already mentioned um, using um, uh, personal data, um, importing personal data into your project. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about this because it's very important from a data management viewpoint. Uh, because as you might know, the, the uh, organization uh, that you are a part of is, is considered a data processor under the GDPR and uh, is ultimately responsible for uh, your uh, data handling. So it's very important to note where uh, the information, for example, the personal data is stored and processed when using Envivo. And uh, there are a lot of services in the Envivo family. Some of them are cloud-based, for example, which means that they uh, will transfer data outside of your IT infrastructure, outside of your own workstation or your university service, uh, etc. So you need to use Envivo in a way that complies with the legal requirements uh, for your data processing, but of course, still using it in a way that will fulfill your research needs. So make sure that you know what, where data is, is processed before starting to use any specific function of uh, Envivo. And if you're unsure, please uh, speak with your local research data management function or your data protection officer, uh, etc. Um, so um, Sara mentioned some of the, the uh, products and services. Um, but um, the basic uh, Envivo license enables you to install it on a local computer, for example, on a Windows or a Mac OS computer. And uh, there's also a service called Envivo Collaboration Server, which you can uh, install on uh, a server owned by your organization, for example. And in, in these cases, you are basically fully in control of your data. It will not be sent anywhere unless you use uh, specific uh, functions that actively transfer data outside of uh, your organization. So, um, for example, um, there are um, two services. Uh, one is called Envivo Collaboration Cloud, which Sarah mentioned. Uh, using which you can uh, collaborate uh, over the internet with various uh, researchers. But this also means that the data itself is stored on uh, external servers uh, owned by Envivo. And uh, there is also uh, a um, transcription function. Uh, it's a cloud service, uh, a subscription-based cloud service. Uh, and if you use this service, you will also send the data outside of your organization. So please keep this in mind uh, if handling personal data and especially sensitive uh, personal data. Uh, there is also uh, some telemetry. When you first start uh, Envivo, you're asked for um, 
participation in the NVVO customer experience improvement program. And this does not transfer any data itself, uh, but only statistics about, for example, which functions you're using the most and so on. Um, but uh, of course, you, you might opt out of this function if you want to. And uh, this is a screenshot of um, how it looks when you have uh, the modules tab open and have clicked on transcription. So this is uh, a, a login uh, window for um, the Envivo transcription service. Uh, just screenshotting this so that you know how it looks. Uh, but this is a separate service which you transfer your data to. So please keep in mind that this uh, you should not use this if, if you, you, you can't transfer your data outside of the organization. And Sarah mentioned this briefly also, and I would like to emphasize this. So when using a local install of Envivo, uh, you are basically working with a database file that's uh, open on your computer. And uh, this might, may be damaged if uh, you are storing it in a folder that is actively synced to cloud storage. So for example, if your organization uses Suda Drive, or if you use OneDrive, uh, Dropbox, iCloud, uh, Google Drive, etc., uh, if it's actively synced to a cloud service, uh, this might may conflict with uh, Envivo itself. Uh, so, um, and, and that's a really bad thing because uh, if, if the cloud uh, service tries to, to lock the file while, while you're working with it, you may actually damage it in a way that you can't open it again. So there are two basic solutions to avoid this. One is, as Sara said, to always save it uh, locally only. Uh, and um, of course, uh, whenever you're able to, uh, save backups manually to your cloud storage, but never use the, the active project file uh, with active uh, cloud storage. And the other solution is, and this requires discipline, uh, to just pause the syncing of your cloud service before opening uh, the Envivo software and the project and make sure that you have closed the project uh, before turning it on again. So these are your options. Um, and um, for example, if you, uh, you can link external data files to an, an Envivo project, and they are not really uh, affected by this. So you may keep them in cloud storage, but the actual uh, project file itself is vulnerable to this. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, project documentation. Uh, Sara has showed you already a lot of uh, possibilities for uh, documentation. Uh, but the important thing is to uh, make the project itself understandable uh, by uh, reusers or reviewers, for example. Uh, someone might be required to, to review how you have performed your analysis. Uh, so it's especially important to, to document um, things that relate to the analysis framework and, and your thought process, your analysis process. Why have you added this? Why did you make this code? Uh, is this coding a part of some uh, published coding scheme or something like that? Uh, and and uh, there's a, uh, as you have seen, uh, a description field for almost any object that you can add to an Envivo project. And uh, it's always accessible uh, when right clicking on an object in, in Envivo. Uh, in Windows, it's uh, always under right click and properties. So, for example, code properties, uh, case properties, properties, and so on. And in the Mac version, this is called get info, but it's basically the same, uh, the same properties window. And uh, so for example, if, if adding a code, uh, you will get the description box as you have seen already. 
And this is uh, the perfect place to put uh, contextual documentation on the function of the object itself in your project. So for example, here with some uh, reference to, to, to some scheme. And, and uh, there's also a screenshot of, of the uh, uh, context menu where you find the properties. So if you are uh, using uh, the description fields in a systematic way, uh, you will also be able to uh, create um, nice lists uh, using this um, column editor. So uh, most uh, sections in, in Vivo have a list view. And if you customize that list view uh, to also include the description field, you will be able to export very neat uh, Excel sheets uh, with the documentation of all the objects in your project, uh, which may be used to um, uh, create external documentation files, for example. Uh, and this, this is the context menu. So it, basically, if you right click on uh, white space, uh, empty space in any uh, list view in MVivo, you will be able to export a uh, spreadsheet file, uh, Excel file. And this is a great way, of course, to, to systematically uh, create documentation for a project. Uh, and uh, lastly, as, as Sara also said, the um, REFI QDA format uh, is a uh, interoperable format that can be read um, by other QDA software. Uh, so, for example, Atlas TI and, and uh, open source QDA software and so on. And if you use the export function to export to Refi QDA, uh, it will not save everything in your project because there are some functionality in Vivo that cannot be saved. But uh, all the basic functions, uh, for example, interview transcripts, uh, coding uh, sections of text and so on, uh, will be exported in an interoperable way. Uh, so when finishing your project, uh, consider exporting this uh, too and, and um, keep it, store it along with the Enviva files uh, for possible reuse in the future. All right, thank you. So let's see if there are some other questions in the chat or in the uh, questions and answers module. Yeah, I don't think there are. <laughs> I haven't seen any new. Mm -hmm. I, I tried answering them uh, using the uh, uh, questions and answers module uh, using the chat, uh, but feel free to add anything uh, if you think I've left out anything. Perhaps we should should uh, wait a few minutes uh, if if there are no other questions, uh, but feel free to write them in in the Q and A module. So now I can see a new uh, question here. Uh, do you always recommend using cases and classifications, even if not working with interviews? For instance, instance, I analyze letters and the files per se are divided by correspondence partners. What would a case add to it? Um, yeah, what's a good question? Uh, I think that um, 
uh, I haven't seen a project where they don't use cases, but of course, if you don't see any <laughs> any function with it, you you shouldn't do it. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's an it isn't uh, it's not a right or wrong there. Uh, so you have to to test, I think, and see what it can add for you. But but remember that uh, cases and classification it it enables comparison. Uh, in a greater way than just coding does. Uh, I don't know, have you anything to add, Andrea? Maybe you know more? No, basically you are very free to, to uh, assign cases and, and codes. Uh, it's, it's more uh, what's suitable uh, for your analysis itself. It might be very detailed uh, objects, for example, uh, not only people, but uh, I mean, it, you can make it as, as detailed as you want to, really. Yes, so so you have to uh, test what suits your project, <laughs> I think. So, uh, and the next question now in the chat is how can we access uh, the recorded file and the uh, I think we can access it from you at s and but it will maybe take a while. Yes, exactly. We will need some post-processing and editing, uh, but it will be available on our YouTube channel. And the next question, is there a good way to test what functions process data outside of the organization? Uh, maybe you can answer that better, Andrea. <laughs> Well, uh, you could, of course, uh, monitor the, the network traffic itself. Uh, and if you are um, really uh, concerned about um, information security, you could, of course, run NVivo with a limited network connection. Uh, but it will need to access the internet uh, from time to time because it checks the license. Uh, but you could, for example, use a firewall. Uh, but really, the the um, what what uh, functions or what services uh, transfer data outside of the organization is pretty clear if you check out the the uh, uh, the list of services and and um, the the ones that actually actively transfer data outside uh, of your organization is subscription based uh, and and. Uh, specific uh, subscription plans. Yes, uh, the next question uh, is about uh, if NVivo has student packages. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think so. I, I can't really give a good answer, but I know that some uh, some universities, in some universities, uh, you can use NVivo as a student, not, not in my university, but uh, I know that there are some. So um, I have to come back on that. I, I don't have, have a good answer right now. So we continue to the next question in the chat, and that is, if you have all your material in one file, let's say, 150 articles and you want to be able to compare the content of the articles, should all articles be coded as, as separate, separate cases? Um, yeah, I, I think that could be a good, I, I think it would make comparison easier if they were separated in a way. Um, but uh, oh, do you have any uh, idea, Andrea? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, was, I was answering using the chat. Oh, Could sorry. <laughs> if you have all your material in one file, let's say 150 articles, and you want to be able to compare the content of the articles, should all articles be coded as, as separate cases, one to 150? Uh, 
And I think maybe it, uh, it would uh, make comparison easier if they were separated. Yes, but it truly really, it depends on the needs of your analysis itself. I mean, it might be relevant to make them cases and it might be not relevant to make them cases. Uh, I, I can't really answer a, a generic question like that. It, 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 it depends on really what you are analyzing in your project. So, and the next question uh, is about where to save data. Uh, does Envivo save the data you are importing or synchronize it every time it open it in Envivo? So where is the optimal place to save the original data imported to Envivo? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it, it's partly imported into the project database itself, uh, or it might be a linked file, a relative link uh, to somewhere else on stored on your file uh, system, for example, on your local computer or on net network storage. So, um, but, but of course, uh, it's always a good practice to keep a separate uh, structure with the raw data uh, that's uh, entirely unmolested by Envivo, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> uh, and this is, this is a generic data management uh, advice. Uh, so no matter what, what processing you use, please uh, keep the raw data isolated uh, and untouched uh, and work on copies of the raw data. So I think that was all questions in the chat and we also have some Q&A questions. Uh, yeah, we can answer uh, the question about how, an, uh, how should an interview Word file be prepared before importing it into Envivo? My transcription comes out as just text of myself and the interviewee. Should I annotate and format it like in the template? Uh, yes, um, as long as you use a consistent structure, for example, just um, using uh, interviewer or and uh, some pseudonym for, for the uh, interviewee, uh, and you use that structure co consistently, for example, you make one uh, line break, and then there's the uh, transcription text, and then there's a line break, and then there's the title of the person, and so on, uh, then the autocoding would be able to handle that uh, as long as you prepare the autocoding with uh, pseudonyms and so on. So yes, uh, generally, it's a good idea to format it uh, kind of like in the example. And then there's a question about uh, if the codes will be displayed when exporting uh, list exports to Excel with the descriptions. Uh, yes, uh, if you are in the uh, code window with codes uh, and you have chosen to um, show the code column, which is the default behavior, it will also be displayed when exporting uh, the list export. We have one question left in the Q&A section, but uh, it looks like Sara is uh, answering that using the chat. Uh, yes, it's the, it's the question about in the newest version, how is the comp, 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 oh, it's a hard word to pronounce, <laughs> Co compatibility between Word and Mac for a project. 
uh, and I'm just uh, looking for the right answer, but I know that uh, it depends on how you cooperate uh, in the news version. You can use the collaboration cloud uh, and you can cooperate between uh, uh, and a word, oh, sorry, do you, uh, maybe I read it wrong, uh, if it was Windows or Mac, maybe, uh, I read it as that, uh, because in, in the news version, you can use the collaboration cloud to, if you have a PC and a Mac, that's no problem, uh, but it is uh, problems if you are sending projects as files uh, between participants in a project, uh, then, uh, then it can be a problem. Then uh, the best thing is if uh, every person in the project has the same uh, type of computer. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, I am not a researcher and do not have my own data. I would like to practice and be analysis. Are there any good materials? And I would say that the sample project, as Sarah showed you in, in the demo, is, is a good uh, practice material, a practice project, because uh, they have tried to uh, put something in that project which uses every function of MVO. So that's a good start. Just try exploring it and there are also a lot of good uh, YouTube videos linked from the uh, MVIVO software itself, which explains various parts of the sample project. Yes, and uh, I think we have another question. Do you know if it is common to have the exported projects as appendix in articles or dissertations for in? Stance, uh, I figure an anonymized. Uh, so if we have them as an appendix, I'm sorry to say, uh, no, it's not a common practice. Uh, it would be uh, good if uh, the project files themselves were um, made available in some manner. Uh, so this is this is a, a matter of, uh, of course, reproducibility, accountability. And, and being able to see how how uh, someone performed their analysis, right? So a great question. And um, most of the time, uh, there might be sensitive data or a personal data in the project, uh, which uh, might make it impossible to publish it uh, with open access. But you might, example, for example, make make a, a restricted publication of it uh, where you have to request access uh, to the project or you could also for example um, replace uh, some of the actual data with dummy data uh, and show uh, certain aspects of your analysis there are various ways to, to go about this but great question um, but just as you for example make source code available today i think uh, increasingly, uh, we should make uh, project files like this uh, prepared for reuse, make them fair. All right, I think we have uh, answered uh, most of the questions, if not all of the questions, uh, to the best of our ability. And uh, as Sarah said, uh, the documentation is uh, very comprehensive and uh, please please uh, check out the, the links in the presentation. Uh, the um, presentation files will be made available uh, on the website uh, after we've done. And uh, as previously mentioned, uh, the recording will also be made available uh, in a while. All right, thank you, Sara, and thank you, everyone who was uh, with us today. I will now close the webinar. Bye. Bye.